Um, te doy la palabra. Vale, gracias. Gracias a Joan. Um, so, como ha dicho Joan, um, soy profesora de, de ciencias políticas en, en Salzburg, también en un centro que va a ser próximamente Jamonet Center uh, of Excellence. Y, y a ver, voy a hacer la, la clase en inglés porque, como ha dicho, dicho Joan, toda mi investigación uh, se hace en inglés. Pero si en algún momento algo no está claro, uh, lo decís y lo puedo explicar también en castellano o después cuando haya el turno de preguntas lo, lo, lo podéis preguntar también en, en castellano, en catalán, lo que queráis. A ver, voy a compartir la pantalla, espero que funcione todo bien. ¿Lo podéis ver bien? Sí. ¿Sí? Vale, perfecto. So, pues a ver. Um, básicamente lo que quiero hacer hoy es um, hablar de, uh, de... Voy a cambiar al inglés, ¿no? Um, so what I want to do today is to talk about trilogues, but not just trilogues, also how we get to trilogues and why is it important to understand this process of getting to trilogues. Um, so what happens before we actually get um, to this process where basically the main EU institutions come together and find um, some agreements on legislation. And to do that, what I want to do first is to kind of go over the, the basics of why do we have trilogues, how we, uh, have we come to have these trilogues, um, and then how do EU institutions build positions before they get to trilogues, um, and especially focusing on each of the of the main uh, three EU institutions, and then also talk at the end a little bit about advantages, disadvantages of trilogues, and the impact they've had on the um, uh, on the political system of the European Union. So, let's start with. Uh, a bit of a, a broad overview of um, who decides in the European Union, why do we have trilogues, how, why have they become so important in the European Union. So probably most of you know already this kind of that this is kind of a very basic uh, schema of how the European Union works, of its, in, uh, its institutions. So basically showing that the, the European Union is often seen as a bit more complicated than, than many countries, how it works, because it doesn't have this kind of typical separation of powers where we have an executive and then a legislative body um, and then the judicial uh, system, right? So it's, it's a bit more, more mixed up. We don't have, especially because it doesn't follow what we use, what we know best, which is the parliamentary system. So it doesn't have these dynamics of uh, uh, government and opposition, um, and the functions are often mixed, right? But generally, we could say that the European Commission has the main executive power, so it is the one that comes up with um, the, the proposals for new legislation, and it's also in charge of making sure that member states, other institutions, and everyone kind of applies this legislation, applies the, the treaties of the European Union. And then uh, European Parliament and Council share the legislative power. This is similar to in national systems, for instance, a lower court and a higher, uh, a lower parliament and a higher parliament. So for instance, um, Congress and Senate. Yeah, so that's not so different. With the addition that we have also European Council that is not meant to legislate, it's meant only, only to kind of set the agenda, but we'll come back to the European Council um, later and a bit what, what is now the issue with it. And then of course there are you know different institutions that are supposed to either intervene in specific policy areas like the European Central Bank or to control also this, this process um, such as the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Auditors. And of course, right, um, this, these uh, institutions are either indirectly elected um, by citizens through parliaments and governments, the Council, the European Council, um, 
or like the European Parliament that is the, the, the only institution that is directly elected. While Commission, Court of Justice, European Central Bank, they are non-elected um, institutions. So as I was saying, the, the, the main legislative power is shared by Council and European Parliament. They are the two main co-legislators. So when we speak about co-legislator, we mean the Council where basically the, the, the ministers sit and the European Parliament that is directly elected. Now, um, we have then um, now, especially since um, 2009, since the Lisbon Treaty, we, we have had this um, uh, kind of slightly modified version of co-decision, which is now called the ordinary legislative procedure. And it is called ordinary because it's now applied to almost all the decisions that the European uh, Union takes. Main exception, foreign policy, but otherwise most of the legislative decisions are um, done under this uh, this procedure. Of course, there are exceptions also, for instance, international agreements, and they are done with other procedures. But that's why it's important to understand how co-decision works formally, but then also informally, right? Because uh, basically almost everything is, uh, follows this procedure. And I mean, it, it looks very complicated, right? It looks very long. It looks like, okay, so where are all these uh, arrows going? What is happening here? Um, but in the end, what you have to keep in mind is basically that it's it's really kind of a process of co-decision, right? Yeah? So that's why it's called like that, where we have three readings, successive readings that give council and parliament the chance to basically find an agreement. And it gets more complicated to find an agreement as the process goes. So in a way, in, in first reading, when we start, it's you know, it's easier for the two um, uh, co-legislators to pass their amendments, to pass their agreements, yeah? because they only need kind of in the council qualified majority voting. And especially in the European Parliament, they only need a simple majority. If they cannot find an agreement, they have kind of a, a bit of a, a chance to um, find an agreement just before the, the, the step where you see here that the council has agreed on its position. And then that's what we call an early second reading. And, it, and it's similar a little bit to the first reading. It's just that the basis is not the, the, the proposal by, of the commission, but rather the position of the council. But if it, they don't get to an agreement by that point, then it gets complicated, especially because the, the European Parliament then needs to find an absolute majority. And so that means that it's, you, you need 50% plus one of, of the um, members of the European Parliament. And it means really that it's not just the members that sit that day and um, vote that day, but really of kind of the composition of the European Parliament. So it, it, it makes it much more complicated. Um, and if they cannot find an agreement in the second reading, then there is this idea of a conciliation committee where basically uh, um, a team from the European Parliament and a team from the Council uh, will come together, um, really talk to each other in, in, in this kind of smaller setting and produce this joint text, which then has to go back to both institutions for approval. Now, this looks extremely complicated. It looks very long. The reality is, however, very, very different. The reality is basically that for the last years, we haven't seen any third reading. So we haven't seen any conciliation uh, committees anymore. And even the, the second reading, so, so the one you see here in, in green, you see that it's also like almost disappeared or, or completely disappeared, uh, disappeared in these last years. So everything is done to find an agreement either in first reading or in uh, um, early second reading. So why do we see this trend? You see that this has been really like a quick development from the late 1990s to now. So in about 20 years, um, we've had really this, this process where we had in at the beginning almost, you know, the same amount of first readings, early second readings, second readings, and third readings. And now it's 
it's it's completely different, right? So it the process has changed completely. And so there are several explanations for that. Some of them are structural in the sense that, as I was saying, right? So for instance, the European Parliament can decide with simple majority instead of an absolute majority. So if it votes with a simple majority, it just needs more yes and no's in that specific vote. And it doesn't matter how many people are um, are sitting in, in the parliament on that day. I mean, they need a minimum, but still. Also, one advantage, there are no time li limits um, in the in the first reading. So they can spend as much time as they want, just basically um, discussing and deliberating and so on and so forth. Once we get to the second reading and the third reading, then you we need to get there to a decision at, uh, in a given time. And the, the, the time limits are relatively short. They are a couple of months. And also then it gets more complicated in second reading to amend legislation. So you cannot introduce new amendments uh, as freely as you can in the first reading. So this kind of explains that there are advantages in these early agreements. There are also other explanations that go beyond this, just purely kind of structuralist explanations that, that are linked to, to how the procedure works. One of them is, of course, that people have a lot more to do. There's more uh, legislation. So um, early agreements make it in a way easier or, or they are seen to be more efficient uh, to find uh, to find agreement. And so with more workload, so then, then there is also this idea that, okay, let's let's try to get it done in um, you know, as quickly as possible. Although that is not always the case that, that because we we call them early agreements that they are always faster. The second point is also that in general, the European Union has become much more politicized. Um, so it's more difficult to find decisions. It's um, also more visible, these decisions. And so in a way, early agreements make it also easier precisely because we have no time limits. We can discuss, um, we can also discuss maybe more behind closed doors. Then it makes it easier to find decisions out of the light of um, of public attention, there are no votes until then. So it's easier to kind of pass through um, the, the, the whole process uh, with not so much attention from outsiders and also taking their time. And the final point is also that there's a lot more participants, right? And if you have more participants, you also have to kind of find a way of making the, the system more efficient. And that, in a way, is also what explains why we've ended up with uh, trilogues. So because we have a lot to do, because politicization puts pressure on uh, on the uh, representatives of uh, the member states, so the ministers, but also the, the diplomats that, that represent the member states in the council and also um, the members of the European Parliament, then they've had to find ways of making this process uh, different, of making it more efficient, and in a way also of bringing it out of the of the limelight of, of the public um, attention. And so basically that's how we came uh, to this idea of trilogues. And trilogues in a way are inspired also by this conciliation committee. So this idea that we will then meet with a team of the council, a team of um, uh, the parliament and try to, in a smaller setting, find um, agreements. And so you have here a picture of uh, of a trilogue. You see that, of course, it's not too full, you know, it's not the whole parliament and it's not the whole uh, council that sits there. Um, but still, you know, there are quite a lot of people around the table. And so usually we will have the European parliament on one side, um, and I'll come back to who represents the European Parliament, then the Council of the European Union. On the other side, um, you see that there are fewer people on that side. And then the European Commission also participates because, of course, the European Commission is the one that has produced the text. And it also has still kind of control over the text, right? So it is the one that has to then accept any changes and often it's also the one that then will propose um, compromises or say what is possible, what is not possible. It has also the expertise. So trilogues now usually happen 
um, kind of when um, the council has already negotiated for a while um, and then gets to kind of a common agreement um, to what is often called a general approach, although there are different names uh, uh, for the document. And the European Parliament will also have a mandate, which is a, a, a kind of the, its report uh, for the first reading, but it, it doesn't vote it. So it, it because otherwise we would finish the, um, the first reading. So it goes to trilogues with a report that has been voted in uh, in the committees, and I'll come back to this, but it doesn't uh, actually, it has not yet been voted in um, plenary, and so it does it, it is not concluded. And so this means that these different groups will come and sit together, usually in the European Parliament, sometimes in the Council, and will try to then really just find agreements, so we'll go amendment by amendment, so every single part of the text that the Commission has proposed and try to find an agreement. What is, however, important to understand is that the people who sit here, this is purely informal. Um, it has been become very formalized over, over the years, and you see that it, it's now a lot of people who sit there, but it remains an informal instrument. So anything that is agreed here, so in the end, the, the, the goal is, is, of course, to have a political agreement. But this political agreement, it's just that. It's a political agreement. It's not, it doesn't have any value yet. So what is important to understand is that anything that is agreed here has to go back to the European Parliament and to the Council and that these two institutions as co-legislators have to then approve the political agreement. And so... That is important to keep in mind for what we are going to say later, because of course, everyone who sits here has in their mind, okay, anything that I agree here, I have then to pass it in the European Parliament, in the Council. So my colleagues back home, yeah, so back in my institution need to agree to this. So that this, of course, can be a challenge or it can be also a resource that, that, that you use also in negotiations. And we, we can come back to that later. All right. So when are trilogues used? I mean, um, trilogues are used a bit kind of differently um, and also over time and also depending on the um, on the policy area. Um, so you see that at, at some points there are peaks that often also has to do, for instance, 2013 was just before the, the elections. And I think that this one was also about the reform of the agricultural um, policy. And that was a huge file and it was very difficult. It was the first time that the European Parliament could have anything to say about agriculture. Um, and so basically that's why it took a lot of um, trilogues and that's why probably it's also so high. But you see that since then it has kept kind of more or less at the same levels every year with again 2018 going up because it was before um, the elections in 2019. Uh, and you see then that that also, I mean, 2021, you see that 2020-21, it goes a little bit down also because of the COVID crisis. So that can also explain it a little bit. But you see then that also when it comes to topics, and I mean, this uh, kind of reflects the, 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 the names of the committees in the European Parliament. Some of them probably are a bit more clear than others. I'll, I'll go through this in a second. But that there are kind of important differences in how many trilogues um, are done in every committee. So the, the highest one is 21% um, in the ENVI committee. And ENVI already gives you an idea that that's the environmental committee. Right? Um, and um, IMCO is the kind of internal market um, and kind of all these issues that have to do with internal markets. So in a way, it's also logical that then it, it also has quite a lot of uh, 
uh, of uh, legislation. It deals with a lot of uh, legislation under co-decision, and that's why um, it's also busy in that sense. And the third one is uh, LIBE, which is the civil liberty. So it's a committee that deals with um, all, everything that has to do with migration and also things like uh, internal security, uh, police cooperation, uh, judicial cooperation, and so on and so forth. So that's also what explains that it's one of the busiest ones because basically it, it, it deals with all these issues, which of course, there's a lot of legislation going on. And the other ones, and you see that it, it gets reduced. So ECON is for economic issues, employment, empl is em employment. ITRE is uh, industry and research and trans is transport, right? And all the others then together um, have only 25%. And that has to do that, for instance, in, uh, in a committee like, um, foreign affairs, there's almost no co-decision. Or in a committee like uh, culture, also almost no legislation, right? So because it's not a competence of the, the European Union or it's not a main competence of the European Union. So it has a lot to do with what is the competence of the European Union? So where does the European Union legislate? And then a little bit also what is salient at, at this time, right? So what is now in a way, um, important for the legislative term, where has the commission uh, proposed legislation? And this is important also to keep in mind, right? That if the commission does not propose legislation, then the parliament cannot do anything, right? So it cannot propose legislation on its own. It can encourage uh, the, the, the commission to do that. It can ask the commission to, it can even propose already um, some ideas, but it cannot really, um, come up with a legislative uh, proposal. Okay, so now we have a bit of an overview of you know, why we have trilogues, what is their place in the decision-making process and also uh, when they are used so that, that they are mostly used in areas where the EU has a lot of competences and where we have a lot of legislation going on. Um, but as I was saying, right, it's it's, each institution will go to um, trilogues already with a mandate, right? With their own position. Um, and for that, then it's important to understand how do they get to this position? Um, and you know, wh why is it um, then relevant to understand the, the, the internal doings, the internal kind of dynamics of um, these different institutions? So if we start, with um, the council, um, basically the council has its main seat in, in Brussels, right? So I don't know if anyone has been to Brussels, but they have two main buildings, uh, the, the Eustus Lipsius, um, and then now the, the Europa um, or, or Europe uh, building. Um, and it's important to understand that th there are no people that permanently work there in the sense that, of course, the ministers come from the different ministries in the, the member states. And the same is for uh, the experts. There are, however, some people uh, who do sit there and that's with what you see in this diagram. So the different kind of levels of um, decision making in the council, right? So first of all, it's it's important to understand that the council is is one, right? So we have one council, one council, but it has this kind of ten different configurations, and that's a bit similar to the committees in the European Parliament. So we will have uh, configurations for agriculture, for competitiveness, for environment, uh, as we've seen before, justice and home affairs, which could be the the kind of parallel to the to the Libe Committee in the European Parliament. Uh, general affairs, foreign affairs, and so on and so forth. Um, so it has these 10 configurations, but in the end, any of them can actually decide on any sort of decisions of the council. So, and sometimes you will see that uh, a decision on environment has actually in the end been voted by, I don't know, the transport, um, the transport um, kind of, um, Confi uh, configuration of the of the council, and so 
that, that is important to keep in mind yeah that in the end it is everything is done in the name of the council but of course in terms of organization different ministers will sit in different uh, configurations and also that maybe different ministers will sit in the same configuration depending on what is being discussed so for instance if you look at the at the, the employment social policy health and consumer affairs configuration this is very broad right and so sometimes you will have the health minister sitting there sometimes you will have the employment minister sitting there right so um you may also have different people from the from each country sitting in these um configurations under so the ministers of course are not always there they come depending on um on how important the, the issue is, they might come once a month or they might only uh, go to Brussels twice a year. So that, that depends a little bit, right? So some of them um, like uh, ECOFIN or, um, or for instance, uh, the General Affairs Council, they take place more regularly, but some others like for instance, the one we were just talking about now, employment, it's not, not so uh, regular, it doesn't happen so often. And so to prepare this work, to prepare any decisions that the ministers make at the end, we have then this kind of committees of permanent representatives in the council. And basically, these are diplomats, so they have the, the, the permanent representatives have the, the status of ambassadors, um, and they are the ones who will kind of um, prepare all the decisions and try to find as much agreement as possible. And so that's why we have also two colors, because we have two committees of permanent representatives. So Coroper one is usually seen as a bit more kind of technical, Although, I mean, issues like agriculture can also get extremely uh, political. And Coriper 2 is seen as a more kind of political because it basically covers what we also know a bit as core state powers. So these, these competences that are really very much attached to the powers of, uh, of, of, of a state, right? So like financial matters, economic matters, uh, justice and home affairs, so things like migration, borders, and so on, right? And foreign affairs and so on. And But in order for the uh, core repairs to decide as much as possible before things go to the, to the ministers, then we also have all these kind of working parties or working groups um, that you see at the bottom. Um, and that basically these, these are kind of there might be tens of working parties happening every day, and these are made up of experts from usually the ministries or agencies coming from each member state. So each ministry or agency will send uh, someone that they think is, is specialized in whatever is being discussed, and they will go to Brussels and, and really try to then um, discuss about kind of the, the, the kind of more technical aspects. Um, and I'll come back to how it happens then later, but just to kind of understand a little bit um, what kind of determines the, this mandate of the council, right? So it's important to understand that, that the council uh, basically does not um, have this kind of stable coalitions, right? So it's it's not... Um, it's not a government. It, you do not have this kind of government opposition, right? So you have representative of every single um, member state. And that is why often, um, you know, they, they will represent their national interests and this national interest will also be um, determined by many different things, right? So there are issues that will be kind of um, classical and where even if uh, governments change at the national level, the national interest or what is seen as a national interest will not change. Um, but some other things might change depending on who is in the government back at uh, um, back in the country. So back uh, in the country of origin. Um, you have a picture here of basically this idea of the rotating uh, presidency, right? So that the idea that there will be one country that is, uh, presiding the, the council um, and basically this rotates every 
uh, half year. So maybe some of you know that Spain is actually now the um, the presidency or has the presidency of the council, um, which of course gives this country some some opportunities to put some issues on the agenda to kind of also determine a little bit the speed of negotiations, also try to get deals that maybe are interesting for the country, but also, you know, it, it has to act a little bit as a an honest broker. Yeah. So it has to also be seen to be fair and to be efficient and so on. Um, but this is important, right? So that the presidency then will have to determine, okay, what are the positions of the different countries? Why do they have these positions? Are they really like very set positions, can they change, can they move, how can we make compromises, how, and then often you will have things like package deals, okay, so I give you this, you give me that, um, or try to have some sort of um, side payments to say, okay, so if you agree to this, then we'll give you something else, um, but that this is then a process internally to the, to the council of finding compromises, and there, I mean, there are many different explanations for you know, why some countries are um, um, more powerful than others or get better deals than others. It might have to do, of course, with size, right? It's also because of the of the voting uh, weights. Um, it's kind of, and, and you see here kind of the, the, the voting weights um, in, in the, also if you take the, the blue ones, it's, this could be now in the EU 27, so the current ones. And of course, right, so it makes a difference if you're Germany, which then has like 18.5, uh, uh, or if you are, um, I don't know, let's say Malta, which has uh, uh, 0 0.11 in terms of uh, percentage, right, in, in, in the weight. So just because Germany is bigger, then of course, it will be very difficult to have agreements without at least some of the big member states like Germany, France, um, Italy, and to a certain extent, also Spain and, and Poland. But then, you know, at some point, I mean, the, the, the council works basically uh, with consensus, right? So there will always be an effort that even if something is seen as very important for Malta to really accommodate also the, the interests of Malta, even if they have almost no, no power. So this is important to understand that this is often a, a kind of a long process, yeah? And of course, um, the, the parties of the different governments might make a difference. So this might also make a difference over time on how, whether we get to a mandate of, um, of the council or not. Um, and we saw it, for instance, with issues like migration, that while we had certain um, uh, parties in government, take, for instance, uh, Salvini in Italy, there was no way to find a, 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 an agreement in the council. Once it's changed, um, it, it's become more uh, a bit easier to find some sort of compromises. And of course, also what is important is that these coalitions will then also change depending on 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 the sectors, right? So there, it's not that we have I don't know Germany always going together with the Netherlands and Denmark, yeah. So maybe in some in some point in some areas, yes, but in some areas, it's not going to be the case. So there's a lot of that's why it often takes so long to find a position in the in the council because basically. Um, you have to accommodate a lot of uh, different interests. And with 27 member states, this has often become quite complicated. So, I mean, formally, this is basically how this is done, right? So that the, com the commission will have the proposal and then it will go to the working party and the working party will try to decide on as many uh, issues as possible, right? So, and, and this will be usually kind of the... the the more technical um, issues. Um, and then at some point um, it will say like, okay, look, you know, this is now getting too uh, political. This is getting too complicated. We cannot find an agreement on this and this and these issues. And that is a bit kind of like this difference between A items and B items. So that if um, an A item means basically that it has been agreed, it will go through the process and most of the time, no one else is going to have a look at it. This will kind of be like, okay, this has been agreed in the working party, fine, done, we can forget about it. Those things that are not yet done then will go to the core pair, so the committee of permanent representatives, and it will happen the same thing, right? So that they will kind of 
um, discuss this um, and then until they get to a point where it's like, okay, this is too political, we need here kind of the final say from the ministers. And so the, then the, the, the same will happen, right? So those that have been agreed will go as A items and so no discussion. And then those that have not been agreed will be probably discussed again um, by, by the ministers and you know see whether if they find a, a, an agreement good and then there's a formal decision. Otherwise, it will probably go back either to the co repair level or even to the working party level. So this is a formal system, of course. In practice, it's it's much more dynamic. Yeah. So many things will go to the working party, then to co repair. Co repair will take it down to the working party again, um, or uh, then to the ministers and back again. So th there will be much more back and forth, and they can also play with what is gets on the agenda, what gets not put on the agenda, and so on and so forth. But the ideas are basically in the end, when things are going to be negotiated, there will be what is generally called kind of a general approach that says, okay, this is the mandate um, of the council. And now we allow the presidency to go to trilogues. And so this is important that in council, it is the presidency. So now for instance, the, the, the Spanish representatives who will go to, uh, will represent the council in trilogues. Um, of course, supported by the staff of the general secretariat, um, supported by legal service and so on and so forth. But this is really kind of interesting to see that 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 the um, the council does not kind of have you know twenty seven people attending trilogues, but really in a way give this mandate to one country, so the presidency, and then. It is only this country that then will sit in trilogues. And this has, of course, advantages and disadvantages, right? So it can be an advantage for the council because it can say, well, you know, that the, the, the presidency can say, like, oh, well, you know, this is a new compromise. And hmm, I'm not sure if my colleagues in the council will agree to that. Hmm, let me note it down and I'll ask them. And then we can continue discussing another time. Or to say, Oh, well, no, you know, I know that uh, this is not going to get through. I mean, I know that uh, uh, there are many countries and probably they are not going to even say which ones or how many, but there are many countries that cannot agree to this. I mean, this, this is never going to uh, get through in the council. So, you know, we cannot accept that. And of course, it's often then very difficult for the other uh, people around the table in trilogues to know, is this true or is this not true? I mean, how do we get maybe information about the position of the different countries and whether they could actually potentially accept this or not? So this, of course, can become an advantage for the, uh, for the presidency to say, well, you know, I mean, we don't know. I mean, either we don't know or we know this, this is not going to be accepted. So uh, they often play with uh, this strategy of kind of having their hands tied by their colleagues in the council. All right, so that's basically for the council. So basically that's kind of the internal process and then there will be a mandate. Presidency will go to the trilogues. If there's a political agreement, then it will come back um, and basically to be approved by the ministers. So the European Parliament is in a way a, a bit kind of different in the way it works because uh, of course it's it's uh, a parliament so it has a, a slightly different structure but in a way that the, the logic is not so different in the sense that parliaments or any decision that is made by the European Parliament has to be done has to be approved by the plenary so any sort of decision cannot be formally cannot be done by the, the different committees, it has to be taken by plenary. Um, so plenary is made up of 705 uh, members of the European Parliament, so MEPs. So if I say MEPs, this, this is what it is, right? But of course, because everything, you know, as we were saying, a lot of things to do, high, very high workload, plenary cannot deal with every, everything. What it does is to kind of delegate the work of preparing, of discussing the proposals of the Commission, preparing um, any modifications to this kind of 20 committees. 
And as we saw, some of these committees will be have more to do with uh, um, a co-decision than others, right? So environment, uh, a lot of, of co-decision um, kind of debates and, and procedures and so on. While, for instance, uh, foreign affairs has almost nothing. Um, so basically, in between these kind of two levels, we have also political structures, such as the Conference of Presidents and the Bureau. So this is basically either with, where the vice presidents sit or where the political group's leaders sit. And these are important in case that, for instance, there are conflicts or uh, a committee has reach kind of a, a position that is very weird and that not everyone can share. So maybe then, you know, there will be compromises made also by the different uh, leaders of the political groups, and then they might propose an alternative um, agreement. But most of the time, any kind of proposal that is made by the committees is usually followed by plenary. And then in committees, basically, there are a couple of people who are um, particularly important, and these are basically um, the rapporteurs. So our rapporteur, so it's it, it, this comes from French, right? And, and it means to report. So basically, it's the person who's in charge of writing the report. So basically, the, the commission will send the, its proposal to the European Parliament. The Parliament will decide, OK, this proposal is going to be dealt with by the Environment Committee, and then the Environment Committee will give responsibility to a reporter. And this person will then have to write a report, which is basically, um, and I'll show you in, in, in a second, but basically it is kind of collecting um, the different amendments, the different changes to the legislative proposal of the commission, and then also kind of finding a compromise within the European Parliament, so building a mandate for the European Parliament. So in a way, it's a bit the same role of the presidency, but in the European Parliament. However, because, I mean, this idea of the rapporteur has existed, I think, since the very beginning, so for a very long time. But at the beginning, when we uh, started with Trilog, so in the especially in the early kind of 2000s, um, many people were like, OK, you know, we are losing control of what is going on here. I mean, basically, we would have these dynamics where the rapporteur will go, could go and sit with uh, the presidency of the council and maybe a, a representative of the commission, sometimes not even that. And, you know, among two, three people, they could find an agreement and they could reach this political agreement. And so people then in the committees were like, OK, uh, what is going on? You know, you've come back now with an agreement that has nothing to do with what we discussed here. Um, so, you know, kind of some some people were telling me back then, so they go with a horse and come back with a camel. Yeah, so this idea that um, suddenly you have something that you cannot recognize. And so th that created concerns in the European Parliament. So within the European Parliament that they were losing track of what was going on in, in trilogue, so they didn't know what was uh, what was happening, that uh, the information was not flowing, that then also this created problems because maybe disagreements uh, could not be ratified then in the committee. And that's why they started using this idea of the shadow reporters. And as the name kind of indicates, they shadow the rapporteurs. So basically, they accompany the rapporteurs, they go with them, they follow the process, and now they are also part of the negotiating team. And so they will come from each political group. And so each political group, usually they don't have to, but usually they will nominate one MEP to then work together with a rapporteur. Um, and then we have also the chairs of the committee who often will also chair the trilogues and who also kind of act a little bit as, as and that there it might depend a little bit on the person. So some of them will also take on the, the, the role of negotiators in trilogue. Some of them will just chair the trilogue. So that, that might depend a little bit on each chair. And then the coordinators. So these are MEPs who are also kind of nominated by each political group. 
um, to coordinate the work of this political group in a committee. And so these are people who basically keep an eye on what is going on in different files. So then they will try to say, well, you know, if you do this here, that might be a problem for the, the other file and so on and so forth. So they kind of keep an eye on this. And sometimes they will also then be part of trilogues. So how does the um, European Parliament kind of build a mandate? So as I was saying, right, so the, the, the goal is to write a report and the report is basically, I mean, that, that's just a, a very small part of it, but this is an example of how a report looks like. So basically um, you will have the text of the commission on one side and then um, amendments proposed by um, MEPs, usually MEPs of the committee and most usually it will be actually the shadow reporters who uh, produce the most uh, amendments because they are more involved in the process because they know the text better and so on and so forth, but not only. And you see also that it doesn't have to come from just one MEP, it can come from several MEPs and sometimes even from MEPs from different political groups. And so basically um, that's what they are going to do, right? So write an amendment, which in this case, for instance, it's kind of adding something to what the commission has proposed. And then often, not always, but often you will also have a justification. So why do we need this amendment? And so in theory, so what, how it works is that the basically the, the rapporteur will produce a draft report. This will go to the committee. Um, then uh, individual MEPs or, or MEPs in groups will produce also additional amendments or amendments to what, or kind of also changes to what the, the uh, rapporteur has proposed. And then these will then in the end get voted in um, a committee meeting. And that's, for instance, you have here an example of uh, a committee meeting in the in transports where you have like kind of people voting um, a report. However, in practice, so this is the formal way of doing this. In practice, that we will have a little bit like almost like uh, small trilogues happening in uh, the European Parliament. So basically we, we will have informal meetings, which are these kind of shadows meetings. Um, and the one that you have here, I mean, there are not that many pictures available, but the one you have here um, is of two committees. So probably it's it's a bit bigger than they usually are. Um, but you, But these are kind of meetings that are totally informal and where basically the reporters and the shadow reporters and the chair often with the help of assistants and political advisors of the different groups and maybe the coordinators will sit there and try to find an agreement already on these different amendments so that then when it comes to the committee, you already have kind of a compromise, right? And so you already know that what, what the mandate is going to be. So the, what we've also seen is that the more complicated things are or the more politicized or the more attention there is on certain negotiations, the more they make use of the shadows meetings because it's a way of insulating themselves. Um, once the committee has voted on, uh, on, on a report, so on this mandate, this will go to plenary, but plenary is not going to vote on it. What it's going to vote on is uh, whether this mandate is okay and whether they agree for the, the the team of the European Parliament to go and start trilogues. And this is, again, something new that has been happening for now maybe uh, I don't know, five, six years, which, again, responds a little bit, I mean, comes as a response also to this idea that we don't know what is happening. And, you know, committees sometimes they have very different ideas to what the plenary wants. We want to make sure that the mandate that you have to go to trilogues actually can be supported also by the plenary. This is very typical, for instance, in committees like agriculture, where you have people who have very different kinds uh, kind of interests to the other MEPs in plenary, because you have a lot of people who come from regions where agriculture is very important. They are farmers themselves, or they are very close to farming interests. So they tend to be much more 
bias, if you want, uh, towards this kind of farming interest than compared to the other MEPs. And so there are some things, you know, there, there have been problems. And that was a way of avoiding this, of saying like, no, you know, we don't agree with this mandate, go back to committee, rework it, and then come back to us and present it again. Most of the time, it's going to be approved, and then they can go to trial. And that's a bit the question. So who goes to a, a trial from the negotiating team? Uh, so who, who is part of the negotiating team in the European Parliament? So basically, and I mean, this is a bit of an old picture. So that's why probably we have fewer people here than, than what happens now. But I wanted to use this picture because I, I actually kind of follow these um, negotiations and, and I knew many of the people here. And so I knew who they were and what their function was. So first of all, we have the chair and as you see, he's kind of in the middle. And so he's chairing also um, the trilogues, right? And in this case, this is a, a Spaniard, um, uh, Lopez Aguilar, who is still um, uh, the chair of the Libre Committee. And then we have another Spaniard, um, uh, Masi Pidalgo. And he was a reporter, but for instance, in this case, he was a relatively weak uh, reporter also because he was sick for a long time. And so this was one of those cases where, for instance, Lopez Aguilar then took over the, the role almost of reporter and he was very much involved in the negotiations. Then we have uh, Jean Lambert, um, who is not there anymore because she was a British MEP, but she had been an MEP for a very long time. And she's a, a shadow reporter from the Greens. And then we have the assistants, right? Um, so you see they sit next to the, the MEPs and so they are there to help the assistants. The one on the, on the very left, um, she's actually a colleague of mine. You know, she went on to do a PhD or actually she was doing the PhD at that point. Um, and also she's now a professor for European law. So, you know, I mean, you can always um, kind of combine these different roles. And then we have political advisors. So these are people who are staff of the political group. So they are not elected. They are, they have been there often for a very long time. She's, for instance, a political advisor for the Social Democrats. She had been there for a very long time, dealt with these issues for a very long time. So they have a lot of expertise, also this kind of long-term perspective. And then we have like staff of the European Parliament. So officials, civil servants of the uh, European Parliament, the legal service, extremely important um, to give uh, kind of legal advice, staff from the committee. Again, a lot of expertise because they've often been there for a very long time and staff for from a unit that is the conciliations and co-decision unit, which has a lot of like um, kind of this, this transversal view of what is going on in different negotiations. So this kind of is the, the, then the, the kind of people who will sit um, in, in a trilogue, many more people, right? Because as we said, you will have more political advisors and more assistants and more shadow reporters. So, this is only kind of a, a partial picture, but it gives you an idea of who kind of sits there. And of course, you see then, compared to the Council, many more people for the European Parliament sitting in trilogues. And this can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage, right? So it can be an advantage because, of course, well, first of all, it's often the European Parliament who organizes the trilogues and who chairs the trilogues, right? So that gives you a certain... Um, power first because you're kind of playing at home, right? And that always gives them an advantage. And also because, of course, the chair then has much more control over the, the, the speed of negotiations, what comes on the agenda, and so on and so forth. Um, it can be an advantage also because if there is any new proposal that comes a little bit out of the blue or that can be complicated, you have all the political groups represented there. And so you can be almost sure that if if there is an agreement from the parliament side, so if, if they find kind of an internal agreement that they say, okay, the council has now proposed this, what do we do? Then often they will leave the trilogue, talk among each other, um, try to say, okay, do we agree with this or not? Can we maybe propose something else? And then if there is kind of an internal agreement, then you can be sure that whatever comes in out of the trilogue is going to be supported also back in the European Parliament when it's it's voted um, in committee or in plenary. 
It can also be, of course, a disadvantage, right? Because you have many more voices, although most of the time it's going to be only the chair or only the reporter that, that speaks. So most of the shadows will not speak. So it's become also very much kind of a theater, um, very much rehearsed, very formalized. Um, but of course, there are also opportunities for either the Commission or the Council presidency to go to certain MEPs and try to say like, okay, let's make a deal, right? Or can you convince your colleagues? So it's also easier than to split them up. So uh, it can be an advantage, it can be an, uh, a disadvantage. Okay, and then finally for the Commission, I mean, it's probably the more straightforward one because of course the Commission in theory is not a political institution. It's 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 a technocratic institution. Of although of course it has become much more political, um, also much more hierarchical. With kind of the 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 College of Commissioners having a lot more control over what is going on in the administrative part of the Commission and what is being decided. Um, but of course it has. A different logic, yeah. Also, because the commission, in a way, is the one that proposes, proposes it controls the process, but in the end, it, it does not have to vote on 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 whatever is decided in in trilogues. Um, so basically, the commission has this structure where we have the president, then the college of commissioners, which of course also entails the president. Um, this a bit also, some of the names uh, uh, do not apply anymore because we had some recent changes. Uh, but basically, you can still see that, you know, these, these different commissioners will be um, in charge of different um, areas. We have now also this idea of um, commissioner teams that kind of, so people like commissioners that deal with connected issues will then try to also work together, often supervised by a vice president of the commission. So again, this more hierarchical structure now in the commission with president, vice president, and then normal commissioners. And then each commissioner will then, and, and this is also reflected here a little bit with, you know, kind of the vice presidents on top and then the, the normal vice presidents under them. And then each commissioner then will be in charge of one or more than one director general. And these are the, the services, right? So this is the administrative part of the commission where the different officials, the civil servants sit, and they are the ones, that, the experts that then prepare um, legislation. So in that sense, it's a bit similar to national ministries, probably more specialized than, than national ministries. What's important to keep in mind is that between the different director generals, there's a lot of differences in terms of influence because of budget, because of the culture they have, because of the type of staff. Some of them have uh, more uh, political scientists, for instance, working there. Some of them have only uh, lawyers. Some of them have a lot of economies. So the profiles might change. Uh, some of them might have other type of expertise. Um, and so they create their a little bit their own cultures. But what is important also to to remember is that more and more um, they need to cooperate, and and many issues will fall in between different units or between different um, di director generals. And that is why the the commission has realized that it needs to coordinate much more. And that is a bit kind of the process of decision making within the commission on how to get to a position that then um, leads to, you know, kind of some people from the commission, some representatives sitting in a, a trilogue. And a bit also like in the council, we have this technical level and this political level. Um, so basically what will happen is that the the director general that is responsible for preparing this piece of legislation will also prepare what is called this kind of GRI fish. So this GRI is this kind of this um, interinstitutional um, group, so group de relation interinstitutionnelle, so in French, right? So 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 interinstitutional relations group, um, and basically. Um, they are going to prepare what is called a fish again, you know, influence from fr uh, French. So this kind of memo, where basically they say, okay, wh what are the main issues here? Uh, how could it uh, relate also to other DGs or to other services? And then they will send this fish uh, to to consult also colleagues in other DGs. 
um, and also consult, uh, for instance, the legal service uh, and the main sec uh, secretariat. Um, then this will kind of go up and will be discussed among these uh, different services. So uh, it will be discussed also between different like people who are in charge from each of these DGs to kind of discuss this together. Um, and then as many technical issues as possible are going to be um, to be discussed there. So with these kind of officials from each uh, director general, um, and they will try to agree on this fish, right? So that so, so they will have this draft one, and then they will try to say, okay, this is now kind of the, the final one at the technical level. And this is then going to go into um, what is called this kind of green meetings. Um, and so basically there we will have people who are a bit higher up in the hierarchy um, of each kind of um, you know, services, but basically also who represent every single commissioner, so the cabinets. So cabinets are basically staff, but they are there to support the, the commissioners. So you won't have the commissioners there, but you will have their staff there. Um, and these are more kind of political support figures. And so then they are going to also kind of try to discuss this, see if there are any political issues that need to be raised. Um, and this is then going to go into kind of the next level of seniority in this kind of EPTO, which are basically weekly meetings. And then finally, once everything has been sorted out, um, it's going to go to the weekly meeting of commissioners. And if anything is too complicated, if there are no agreements, if there are conflicts between the different um, the different uh, kind of areas of the commissioners and so on and so forth, then um, it's up to the commissioners to find, to say, okay, this is going to be then the, the final position of the commission. Of course, this, again, this looks very kind of nice, yeah, but it's much more complicated. It's a lot more of like back and forth, but it is a way that the commission has found to basically create also a mandate to kind of have an idea of what are the interests of all the services of other areas of the commission and to also involve the political level so that it's, um, that it's going to be clear then what is going to be negotiated in trilogues. Another point that is important is that who represents the, the, the commission, that might also depend a little bit on the type of trilogue, whether it's more technical than it might be, for instance, a director general, um, or if it's more political, so especially that the last trilogues, often then it will be the commissioner himself or herself who is going to attend uh, trilogue. So this might depend a little bit on the le level of um, political kind of difficulties in trilogue. And now in most cases, the last trilogue, uh, um, it's expected that the commissioner will be there. All right, so we have kind of now an understanding of you know how this works and um, and you know how each um, institution forms a mandate. And so now a bit it's a question of like, okay, so why, you know, I mean, this all seems very structured and then it's it's kind of a place where we then can find compromises. So why are kind of trilogues is still very much contested? Um, so there are different views on, you know, the good things and the bad things about trilogues. One of them is basically what we were already talking a little bit about, this idea of efficiency. How do you want to find compromises with uh, you know, a, a whole parliament or a whole committee and also 27 member states of the European Union and the commission, right? So, and all these different interests also that are represented in the commission. So it's seen very much as kind of, well, you know, it is basically, it makes things more efficient if we want to find compromises in the end that are going to be supported by both institutions, then uh, we need to find these kind of spaces where we can find um, where we can find kind of political compromises. Always with this idea, of course, that you know it needs to be agreed within the council, within the, the parliament, have the, the also the agreement of the commission, and then be voted by both. Uh, lots of people also see it as this kind of space to think, right? So it's, and that kind of relates to what we were saying before about the politicization of the European Union. And so this space where you're isolated, insulated from external pressures, 
and where basically um, you have this space where you can have new proposals where you can maybe come up with uh, solutions that had not been uh, presented before. So where you have a bit kind of the space to be more crea uh, creative, right? Where you probably couldn't be if you're always kind of in the focus of attention, if you, you know, what you discuss is going to be also uh, recorded and so on and so forth. So it, it kind of makes it easier also to kind of um, speak more freely and to maybe also overcome um, what could be seen uh, by other people as not being very loyal, right? So if you uh, are making friends maybe with political groups that are not the same, that do not share the same ideas as you or with a council or, right? So it's it's easier then to kind of speak a little bit more freely and to not be controlled by whoever it is, right? Your government or your uh, political leaders, whatever it is. What some people say is that, you know, they've become much more formalized. And this picture also kind of shows you, right? So how many people are there and you have the translators then uh, at, the, at the back, um, you see that, you know, you need now uh, kind of to uh, use uh, screens because otherwise it's difficult to follow. So it's, as I was saying, it's become almost a bit like a piece of theater. It's very rehearsed and uh, the, 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 Commission is going to present its proposal. Then uh, the president is going to present the, the views of the council. The uh, rapporteur or the chair of the parliament is also going to present the mandates, uh, also the different amendments of the parliament. And often it's it's not even like you, you should not imagine that it's like oh you know we are just kind of chatting to each other and so on. It's it's, it's become extremely formalized, um, and it's also. And, and and it's like that because there is very much this concern that no one knows what is going on. And so that's why there have been ways of introducing more controls also from the principles in the sense of, for instance, in the case of the European Parliament, the committees as the, the, the principles and then the the rapporteurs, shadow rapporteurs being the, the, the agents of, um, of the European Parliament. So... There, there are now more requests to report back, to explain what has been going on, to kind of say a little bit about, you know, what has been negotiated, what has been agreed, and so on and so forth. How successful this reporting back is, that that, that is uh, another question, and we can then discuss it later if you're interested. But so some people say, well, you know, it's not as it used to be. I mean, before it was really like no one knew what was going on. It was only a couple of people around the table. Now it's much more representative. It's more formalized. So, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. So, you know, why not? It makes it uh, it makes for efficiency. The disadvantages um, are that, I mean, it's still pretty difficult to know what is going on, what what has been going on. Um, and also how we came to these decisions um, and who proposed them, uh, where did these ideas come from? So for us, especially as researchers, it's, it's extremely difficult to know, okay, you know, what, what was agreed, why, uh, who agreed this, uh, whose proposal was it? And I put here kind of two examples of what we call this kind of four column documents which are kind of pretty straightforward. So basically they will have the mandates. So the, the proposal of the commission, then a mandate of uh, the European parliament, the mandate of uh, the council, and then the compromise proposal. But as you see, I mean, these are two different examples and you see that they already kind of look slightly different, uh, that they might also have a slightly different content that they are dealt with in different ways. So one of them has this kind of green for the things that have uh, been approved, yellow for things that are almost approved and um, and reds for, okay, we still have no compromise at all, right? The other one doesn't use these, they use rather kind of track changes. So that makes it for us also very difficult. So for instance, some people have tried to do it in a more automatic way um, and that, that is almost impossible. And it's also the problem that while the negotiations are ongoing, these documents are not available. And even once uh, the, um, the negotiations are closed and we should have actually access to them. This is what the Court of Justice decided, but even that is still 
quite complicated. So it's it's not easy to know where to find these documents. Another problem, of course, is that um, we end up with solutions that are often uh, this kind of lowest common de denominator, right? And often we will end up with very limited policy changes. So because we have so much compromise, right? We have compromise within the council. We have already compromised within the commission before it, it proposes anything. It will already try to anticipate what the others want and it will already probably not have like very radical proposals. And then we have compromise within the council, compromise within the European parliament and then compromise between them uh, both. And that uh, offers very few chances to have like really big, policy changes. In most cases, it's going to be very kind of centrist um, uh, compromises, so to the center, um, and then often leaning rather towards the council. Um, so so there, there are very few chances for really like big um, changes to how the European Union works, how some policy areas work. So it's more kind of this path dependency and we are only going to have like very small incremental changes. So, and that is a bit, you know, how the, the impact that it's had on the uh, on the political system of the European Union, what how trilogues have um, um, kind of affected the European Union. I mean, on the one hand, I wanted to show you kind of this, this research done by two colleagues who looked at um, how much the text, so, so uh, and they did it with kind of, um, you know, computerized machine learning kind of uh, techniques where basically they look at how much the text um, changes over time, over the, the, the different procedures or the different stages of the procedure. And so basically what they were doing, it was a bit like when we have a, a, a text with track changes, right? That compares what has been deleted, what has been added and so on and so forth. And what they actually found is that um, most of the text actually remain as the commission had proposed it. So this is this kind of like dark gray, right? So the agenda setting stage that then mo most of the changes or, or the, the, the next, type of changes that came, came from proposals through the mandates of the Council and the European Parliament. So it, it, it could be like compromises within the Council and within the European Parliament. So they were proposals by each of the individual institutions. And that only a tiny proportion of um, the changes made in the text came actually from trilogues. Their conclusion was like, okay, so that kind of tells us that we should not worry too much about what goes on in trilogues, because in any case, most of the text actually has already, you know, been agreed in previous phases where either the commission proposes that or where the council or the European parliament as a whole has kind of an eye on this. Of course, what we do not know is like this tiny proportion of that is agreed in trilogues, how important it is, right? Because it could still be like the most important political decisions. That that's what they cannot capture with this um, with this uh, system. But it kind of tells us like, okay, right? So maybe not so much to worry about. But I mean, what we've actually seen in in trilogues is that despite the fact that now in most cases formally council and parliament have the same. Uh, powers, they are co-deciders, council tends to win in trilogues. And that is sometimes still kind of uh, a little bit kind of weird to explain like why is this the, ca uh, the case? And I I've just seen that I put twice the two level games, but I mean, this I kind of already talked a little bit about, right? So this idea that um, council often plays very well these two level games where it can say like, oh no, we cannot agree to that because our colleagues in the council are not going to be able to go with this. Yeah? Or no, uh, we have to postpone this decision because we have to consult our colleagues. So they're very good at doing that and at using this, this kind of uh, games and using the fact that it's only the presence that sits there. Um, only uh, also in terms of like sensitivity to failure in the sense that of course, when we are in a crisis it's a bit different, but often, it's usually the Commission and the European Parliament that are more interested in having some sort of policy change. 
in a lot of cases, member states are actually quite happy with the status quo. So if there's no agreement, okay, they go back to how things were worked and they're happy with it. Then, I mean, also the fact that there's a lot of pressure already since um, co-decision was, was expanded, especially after kind of the Treaty of Lisbon, for the European Parliament to behave responsively. And so often the, the council will use this kind of arguments of saying like, well, you know, we have to implement um, this legislation. We know what the costs are. We know what this is going to do to our national administrations. You, European Parliament, you only have to pass this legislation, but after that, you're not responsible for it anymore. So in a way, always appealing to the European Parliament, okay, so, Please listen to us because we know how this works. We have more information. We have more expertise. And so please don't do things that then we cannot um, uh, implement, that we cannot work with. Um, and that often puts the, the parliament a bit in a, in a difficult position. And finally, also this shadow of hierarchy, which has become also more important. And that comes back to what I was saying about the European Council, that in theory, the European Council cannot decide, but of course, there is this shadow of the European Council that especially if the Council cannot agree on things, then it is expected that decisions, compromises will be found in the European Council. And we've seen this, for instance, very much uh, when it comes to migration. Um, and so in this case, I mean, the European Council becomes an almost uh, decision maker, even though formally um, it should not be like that. And, and this kind of shows that this kind of intergovernmental shadow is still very much present. And so I'm coming to the conclusion. Um, so basically, just to say that, you know, trilogues are now part of the normal life of uh, decision making in the European Union. It's important to know that democratic backlash. So these concerns about democracy, transparency, and so on have led to a formalization of trilogues. They have led to a more kind of institutionalized format of trilogues over time. Of course, this also means that in some cases, there's a shift to even more informal settings. Yeah, that then we will have like also bilateral meetings between presidency and reporters and so on and so forth. So that then there is, again, kind of a shift to backdoor deals and so on and so forth. Also that interestingly, the council uh, still enjoys more informal power, but it's still seen as kind of the, the winner in trilogues most of the, the, the times. Um, and that often, you know, we, we have, I mean, that, that this, um, this use of early agreements and trilogues and so on has become even more important with this idea of like we have now a crisis after a crisis, so the Eurozone crisis and then the migration crisis and then now COVID and then uh, the and so on and so forth, right? So we have like this permanent crisis and that of course creates even more pressure to uh, to insulate, to kind of try to find decisions without all this um, being observed by everyone. And of course, that still raises, I mean, it, it's improved, but the question about transparency, about what is going on there remains. And of course, also the, the question of inclusion, right? So who gets included, whose voice is heard in uh, trilogues also remains an issue. And this became especially important, for instance, in COVID, where only those who could actually be in Brussels were heard, those who did not make it to Brussels, even if they were part of the negotiating team, for instance, um, they, they, they were not heard at all. So it, it kind of shows the, how relevant it is to be in the room and, and be present in trilogues to actually be heard. All right, I'll leave it here and then open, close the, if I can, close this and then I'm open for questions. Thank you, Oriana. Uh, muchas gracias por la uh, más que interesante um, conferencia. En clase habíamos tratado un poco el tema de los trílogos, pero uh, sin llegar a duda no con, los, con este nivel de especi especificidad. O sea que um, uh, muchas gracias por la explicación. Uh, que tenemos sí unos 25 minutos uh, para hacer un poco de debate, de preguntas. O sea que... Um, Adelante, intervenciones, opiniones, uh, preguntas, aspectos que no hayan quedado claros uh, sobre lo que ha explicado Arianna.
Si acaso empiezo yo y después, mientras tanto, los vais pensando, de, a Javier, a, profesor de Política Europea también en la facultad, a, va a intervenir después, pero a, ir pensando vuestras preguntas. Yo a, quería hacer un comentario, o sea, a, a, ha quedado claro ¿no? un poco de la explicación que el procedimiento legislativo ordinario, con sus tres lecturas y tal, es a, un poco... Uh, le falta cierta agilidad um, uh, en ciertas negociaciones y con este proceso más informal de los trílogos uh, se da esta, esta agilidad al proceso, uh, se le hace más eficiente. Uh, hemos visto pero también que, ¿no? ha explicado Ariana, que esto tiene algunos, uh, algunas desventajas en términos de transparencia, en términos también de preponderancia del Consejo, de que lleva a, a lowest common, common denominator, ha dicho, a ajustes a, a reformas más incrementales. O sea, una primera cuestión que quería comentar, Ariane, es ¿no? seguramente en los siguientes años se ha marcado este, el, el Consejo, el otro día en Granada, eh, marcó 2030, un momento para la ampliación, seguramente esto implicará reforma de los tratados, reforma de, de, seguramente del procedimiento legislativo. Um, si a, tu, a, a ti te dijeran, Ariana, en caso ahora que haya una reforma importante, una oportunidad para reformar los tratados, para reformar estos procesos, los triálogos quedarían igual. El, en general, tú dirías al procedimiento legislativo, ¿dónde lo reformarías tú? Quizá institucional más los triálogos, especialmente en un contexto, si, si nos vamos a una Unión Europea de 34 estados, como está sobre la mesa, ¿esto cómo crees que impactaría en, en, en estos procedimientos? Um, si acaso, responde ahora esto y después ya abrimos a, a otras preguntas. Es complicado decir, a ver, ¿cómo, cómo han desarrollado este sistema informal, no sé hasta qué punto mmm, verían un interés en reformar el aspecto formal del de, de procedimiento de codecisión, um, porque funciona así. Hasta con más estados podría continuar funcionando. El problema sería más cómo se llega a, a, a estas decisiones de forma interna en cada institución. Sobre todo en el Consejo sería mucho más complicado y también cómo se reparte el peso, um, cómo se reparte el peso de, 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 del voto. Um, en el Parlamento seguramente también sería más complicado, más partidos más diversidad, más intereses, o sea que, que se podrían formalizar los uh, diálogos en, en los tratados, sí, lo que pasa, um, a ver, hay una cierta formalización ya con, con acuerdos inter, uh, interinstitucionales y, por ejemplo, en el Parlamento está también en, en, la, en el reglamento del, del Parlamento, uh, pero por supuesto, si, sería la la pregunta es si los Estados miembros tienen interés en hacer eso o si prefieren que continúe eh, estando allí de forma informal porque entonces se puede cambiar en cualquier momento. Y como ha funcionado muy bien así, a ver, tenemos que recordar que los, la, esta idea de triálogos viene ya de los años 70 de, de los procedimientos um, presupuestarios, o sea, para decidir cuánto dinero um, se va a dar o, no a la Unión Europea, pero a los diferentes programas uh, de agricultura, etc. O sea que hay una tradición ya de, de tener estos sistemas de, de forma informal y eso es algo que a, a la Unión Europea y sobre todo a los Estados miembros los, les gusta mucho. O sea que no creo que tuvieran interés en formalizarlo. Um, también un poco porque la impresión ahora es que en las instituciones están más aceptados y la gente está más contenta ahora que están más formalizados, que hay más gente en los triálogos, o sea que en ese aspecto no creo que haya un problema. El problema será, por supuesto, dentro de cada institución, cómo se hace con más, con más Estados miembros, más voces, más... Uh, y por supuesto, um, el riesgo también después de eso, ¿no? De quién, quién se incluye, quién no se incluye, o sea, es, eh, um, eso continúa. Pero bueno, pero cómo se hace si no se hace así, ¿no? O sea, Javier Arregui. Uh, gracias, Ariadna, por esta uh, presentación tan detallada y tan profunda, ¿no? porque realmente has explicado prácticamente todo lo que se puede explicar en relación a, a los trilogos. Um, 
Bueno, yo básicamente tengo dos preguntas, uh, uh, una fácil y otra menos fácil. Uh, la fácil es, me gustaría, porque esto que has comentado de, bueno, de los trílogos y de la evolución también de la relación entre el Parlamento y el Consejo, evidentemente es, es un, hay una larga, una larga trayectoria, ¿no? Es decir, el Parlamento ha ido ganando progreso. Esto yo no sé qué pasa, pero esto funciona francamente mal. ¿eh? Uh, y te oigo. Hay... Ha ido ganando a, 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 de un modo progresivo capacidad, ¿no? O sea, si comparamos el Parlamento en el año 58 y ahora no, no tiene nada que ver, ¿no? A, a, y, y de alguna forma la, ha sido una respuesta de la Unión Europea para legitimar un poco el proceso de integración de la Unión Europea. Por tanto, aquí me gustaría que hicieras tú a, a, un poco a, dónde, dónde está a, a exactamente... A, 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 en relación un poco al modelo de sistema bicameral que hay ahora en, en la Unión Europea, dónde estamos y hacia dónde la tendencia, hacia dónde tiene que ir. Ahí me gustaría compararse un poco con el sistema norteamericano, porque claramente a, a, también se basa en un sistema tricameral a, y en el cual claramente está mucho más institucionalizado que en el caso de la Unión Europea, pero claramente el movimiento es ese. Me gustaría si puedes decir algo en, esta, en esa dirección. Y una segunda pregunta que tiene que ver más con, el, con el, la relación entre transparencia y a, a calidad democrática, ¿no? Es decir, a, a el tema de los trílogos es muy interesante y aquí hay como un trade-off entre, entre eficiencia y, vamos a decir, normativamente calidad democrática. Y aquí lo interesante sería ver, o que nos dieras tu opinión a, a, como experta, que, a, en que, por ejemplo, a, a transparencia ya hemos, ya hemos argumentado que no, no hay mucha o que evidentemente es mejorable, a, es lo que has argumentado, pero me gustaría que hablaras un poco de algo que no has hablado, que son los resultados políticos que producen los trílogos. ¿no? Si realmente son resultados democráticamente aceptables, si a, 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 al ser decididos por un número muy limitado de, de actores políticos, eso tiene consecuencias, porque todos sabemos que los, los procesos tienen consecuencias sobre los resultados. Si un proceso se hace bien, sale bien. Y si no se hace bien, pues sale menos bien. Vamos a decirlo así, ¿no? Por tanto, me gustaría, uh, si puedes desarrollar un poco también, porque ahí ya no es tanto aspectos procedimentales, que por supuesto sí que son importantes, sino también ver los resultados políticos que producen ¿no? este tipo de, de procesos. Nada más. Gracias. Gracias, Javier. A ver, empiezo por la segunda pregunta, porque de hecho para mí es más fácil que, que la primera. Um, a ver, en cuanto a transparencia y calidad democrática, ese es el problema de que, Sí, se ha, se ha intentado, por ejemplo, um, que haya más transparencia. Por ejemplo, el, en el Parlamento Europeo ahora, después de cada, de cada trílogo, um, el, uh, tienen, o sea, el, el, el equipo que, que ha estado en el trílogo tiene que explicar y muchas veces o sea, tiene que explicar o, o decir que ha habido un trílogo y uh, qué ha pasado, etcétera, etcétera. Y un, un compañero mío... Uh, Miro todos los vídeos que hay de, 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 en, en, los comi en las comisiones e intento um, ver, a ver un poco la, la calidad de, de, esta, de este método de, 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 de decir a ver qué, qué ha pasado en los trílogos. Y lo que, lo que vio es que en más de la mitad de los casos eh, no, no, no se hacía. Eh, que en, cuando se hacía... En la mayoría de los casos era muy pobre. Por ejemplo, ah, sí, tuvimos un trílogo la semana pasada y ya está. Y que en muy, muy pocos casos, o en, de los casos que, que él miró, era solo un, un, un 1% de los casos, esta calidad de, de, de explicación de, um, era muy, muy buena, era excelente. O sea que eso también te dice que a veces se introducen estos instrumentos para intentar uh, mejorar la transparencia, para intentar uh, um, um, introducir esta calidad democrática, pero después no funcionan porque lo, la, la gente no sigue las reglas o, o no tienen tiempo o no, no tienen interés. O sea que una cosa es un poco es, esos aspectos formales y después qué pasa en, en realidad. En cuanto a los resultados políticos, es un poco lo que decía, ¿no? que el problema es que lo que sale de los... Y, y no solo de los uh, trílogos, o sea, también un poco de todo el proceso de decisión en la Unión Europea, es muy difícil que haya cambios 
digamos, importantes um, en ese proceso. Es casi imposible, porque si tienes que... Eh, o sea, lo que decíamos, ¿no? 27 mi estados miembros, quizá más en el futuro. Um, 7, 8, depende de, 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 de los años, 7, 8 grupos políticos en el Parlamento Europeo con uh, ideas muy diferentes. Um, que tienen que encontrar acuerdos internos y después entre ellos, o sea, ¿qué, qué espacio te queda para poder encontrar un acuerdo? Es, es, es mínimo, es muy pequeño. Con la comisión que también ya intenta uh, ver dónde, dónde es posible encontrar este acuerdo. O sea que ese es un, un, un poco el problema y, y también está relacionado con lo que tú decías antes, un poco del, del sistema político, que como no tenemos um, ese sistema de, de gobierno y oposición, Um, donde puede haber un programa político, donde la gente puede ver uh, si voto a ese partido voy a tener un gobierno de izquierda, si voto a ese partido voy a tener un gobierno de derechas, o sea que la, la oportunidad de, 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 de fijar políticas más de derechas, más de izquierdas, más uh, uh, libertarios, más uh, lo que sea, es casi imposible en la Unión Europea. Y además, claro, depende un poco también de, de, de en qué área eh, estamos hablando. Y eso es, por supuesto, problemático también a nivel de, de, de los ciudadanos, porque en junio del año que viene tenemos elecciones europeas y seguramente la mayoría de la gente no tiene ni idea eh, de qué votar o, o de qué significa eh, o, o qué impacto va a tener lo que van a votar. O sea, es cierto de que, por ejemplo, si la gente vota por un partido de izquierdas o un partido de derechas, este partido va a representarlos bien, por ejemplo, en el Parlamento, o sea, van a intentar tener políticas de derechas o de izquierdas, pero después, en este proceso, todo se diluye. Y ese es un poco el problema, de que es muy difícil ver quién es responsable por ciertas de ciertas decisiones finales y también um, por qué siempre vamos en la misma dirección y por qué no hay cambios. Um, porque básicamente es, es casi imposible, es, todo, todo, todo va hacia el centro. Y ahora que tenemos más partidos radicales, populistas, uh, euroescépticos, todavía más, porque todavía hay más presión de que hay menos partidos uh, que, que necesitan um, hablar entre ellos y, y formar algún tipo de compromiso. O sea que esto todavía es más difícil ahora en, en esas uh, últimas legislaturas. O sea que ese es un poco el problema, ¿no? De que es, queda muy poco claro después también para los ciudadanos okay, quién es responsable de esas decisiones y por qué tenemos estas y no otras um, y, y por qué no vemos cambios importantes. Con lo que tú decías del, del sistema político, es... Es complicado, ¿no? Porque es, es parecido al sistema político en Estados Unidos, pero a la vez um, me, menos político porque la comisión no, no tiene... La comisión no es como el, el presidente en, en Estados Unidos, donde sabemos que o es republicano o es demócrata. O sea, no, no tiene este papel um, político de dar una dirección política a la Unión Europea. Um, en teoría es tecnocrático, en a nivel práctico no, pero está formado por uh, um, políticos de partidos uh, políticos muy diferentes, con una cierta preponderancia, por supuesto, de, de los conservadores o centro-derecha conservadora. Um, ahora con, con von der Leyen todavía más, pero uh, no podemos decir la comisión es una comisión de centro-derecha o conservadora. O sea, eso no se puede decir. O sea, que eso es un poco el problema de que o cambiamos la forma um, de elegir la comisión, y esto hay gente que lo ha propuesto, pero ¿en qué sentido? O sea, de, de que sea más... O sea, que... Y aquí es donde empezamos a mezclar un poco los sistemas más presidenciales como en Estados Unidos y los sistemas más parlamentaristas como... Um, España o como otros muchos países europeos, ¿no? De decir, ah, pero si vamos a elegir la, la comisión, eh, tiene que venir desde el Parlamento, porque siempre hay esa tradición de, de hacerlo sin, así en muchos, uh, en muchos países europeos. Y, y eso después, pues, crea, o sea, cambiaría completamente la, la forma de funcionar el sistema político. 
Y también el, el, el papel del Parlamento Europeo, uh, de las elecciones, etcétera, etcétera. Uh, también podríamos decir, bueno, pues vamos a, a elegir de forma directa la, el, la presidenta eh, o, o el presidente de la comisión. Um, pero entonces la comisión perdería un poco este, es, esa neutralidad que ahora también a veces le ayuda, ¿no? O sea, y eso, por ejemplo, es, es lo que vemos en, en, en los trílogos, que la comisión todavía tiene este, este papel o es, o, 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 o es, o es conocida por, este, por ser un poco este honest broker, este, o sea, um, que es... No, no es político, es tecnocrático, está allí para dar consejo, no para uh, ayudar a, un, a una parte o a, o a la otra, ¿no? O sea, que, que en, en realidad sí que lo hace, pero um, como mínimo se, intenta que no, sea, que no sea vista como favoreciendo uno o los otros. O sea, que no sé si responde a tu pregunta porque es, es una pregunta complicada y no hay un modelo fácil de, para ver si cambiamos el sistema político de la, de la Unión Europea, ¿qué va a pasar? ¿no? O sea, ¿qué, cua, ¿Qué son las consecuencias? ¿Va, ¿Va a funcionar mejor? ¿Va a ser más democrático? ¿O, uh, o va a romper este, esta cultura de compromiso que, que, que es la que funciona en la Unión Europea y que al fin y al cabo, es, 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 también es, es lo que permite llegar a decisiones con tantos Estados miembros, tantos intereses, etc. Gracias, Ariana. So, queda temps para una última pregunta, si hay alguna algún dubte. O sigui, no os anéssiu a casa, no os anéssiu a casa y a dormir avui amb algún dubte sobre el Parlament Europeo, que no os dejéis dormir tranquilos. Es el momento de, de hacerlo. Si no, lo dejamos aquí. Lo dejamos aquí, si de casa. Muchas gracias por la clase.